Um, it's my privilege to introduce today's grand round speaker, Dr. Song Lee. Um, Dr. Lee completed his uh, medical education at Dartmouth, followed by internal medicine training at Emory and then cardiology and subspecialty training here. Suffice it to say that Dr. Lee has been incredibly productive during his time here and amongst his recent accolades. Um, he won the top ASIO cardiac paper last year, as well as the top downloaded paper in ESC heart failure. So um, he's gonna talk to us about something really avant-garde and potentially exciting, and that is a new way of looking at data via machine learning mechanisms in heart failure. So Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Ma, for that introduction. Um, today, I am very excited to talk to you all about machine learning in heart failure, and uh, we will get started. So here are my disclosures. And, you know, I thought that this talk might interest you if you've ever had the following thoughts. One, um, what is machine learning? I see machine learning papers coming out every week in cardiology journals, and uh, what do I need to know about machine learning? What can machine learning really do in medicine? Is it all hype? Also, I've heard that machine learning is a black box and physicians and patients cannot trust it to make medical decisions. I heard that machine learning also needs big data, but we are never going to have millions of, for example, LBAC patients. So if any of that, interest you, um, we will continue. So I'm gonna give you uh, first a 10 minute introduction to machine learning, uh, because I know some of you understand machine learning pretty well, but some of you um, don't yet. Then um, why does heart failure need machine learning? And what are some of the applications um, of machine learning in heart failure? And next I'll talk about some barriers and solutions and future directions of machine learning in medicine and heart failure. So first, like it or not, machine learning is here. Um, this is uh, the number of manuscripts um, regarding machine learning on PubMed, and you can see it's really um, growing exponentially. The word machine learning is um, often used interchangeably uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and uh, suffice it to say that machine learning is a sub um, field of uh, artificial intelligence. And deep learning is another subset of uh, machine learning. Machine learning often uses big data uh, and most of the machine learning algorithms are actually based on um, statistics and math. So how do you define machine learning? There are lots of different definitions. Um, if you Google it, Wikipedia tells you that machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. Well, this pretty much literally you know, explains what you know, machine and what learning is, um, but it still doesn't really tell you what machine learning really is. I actually like this definition probably the most, um, and it's by Professor uh, Andrew Wu at Stanford University. Um, he's really one of the pioneers of machine learning um, in the world. And he says that machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. So let's talk more about that definition. So what does it mean by getting computers to act? Well, um, by act, um, we can mean that um, the computer is making a prediction. It's classifying a phenotype, a genotype, um, or it's finding pattern um, in the data. The computers can also identify pathology on you know, x-rays, ECGs, or biopsy slides. So that's the acting part, that's easy. Next, what does it mean by without being explicitly programmed? And that really gets to the heart of machine learning. Let me give you an example. You are probably all very familiar with this. This is uh, Netflix, you know, movie recommendations. And uh, without machine learning, uh, computer programmers used to um, have to input rules to uh, computer programs to uh, make computers act. 
for example, we humans have to put in, um, if you like movie A, then we should recommend to you movie B and C, um, et cetera. And that obviously is not possible for, um, for example, Netflix, when you are dealing with you know, millions, or I don't know, even billions of uh, users. And it's actually not possible for most of medicine either because medicine is too complicated to be programmed with simple rules. But what machine learning um, does is that um, you don't have to explicitly program it. It uses algorithms to analyze you know, millions and billions of users' data and the computers actually make the decision um, as to what movies to recommend to you based on your preferences and your previous viewing habits. So that's really the key difference between machine learning and classical uh, computer programming. So what are some of the types of uh, machine learning? There are actually many types, but here are two very basic types. Um, one is called supervised learning. And with supervised learning, you have labeled data. And by that, I mean, you know, if, for example, if you're trying to classify images, every image has already been labeled by some expert, um, and that's the data you have. And then you feed this data with the labels um, into a supervised machine learning algorithm, and this algorithm will make a predictive model. And then you can use this model on a new image, and it will tell you, for example, in this case, whether this is a duck, or not a duck. The other basic type of machine learning um, is called unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning is often used for clustering and, you know, in other words, finding patterns in data. In this case, you only have the raw data, um, but without the labels. So you have, you know, five pictures of animals, but you don't know which animal is which. And what unsupervised machine learning algorithms do is that they try to find pattern in um, data. And in this case, um, put them into different clusters uh, based on how much alike they are. So in this case, you, know, you have three animals that look alike and you have two others that uh, are in separate uh, categories. But the machine does not know what they are, but it knows that they are basically in different groups. So that's mostly for finding um, hidden patterns in data. There um, are many different machine learning algorithms. And um, you know, here are all the different names. Um, this is beyond the scope of this talk, but um, they uh, all excel um, for different learning purposes, whether you know, supervised or unsupervised, whether you are trying to classify things or running regression. And uh, you know, here are some um, graphical presentations, uh, representations of some of the different uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, one point I want to make is that um, machine learning algorithms are not uh, magical. You know, they're not some voodoo. Um, they are all based on math um, and all actually have, most of them have very strong theoretical foundation. Um, so it's, it's fundamentally um, a mathematical and statistical problem. Um, another thing that has been uh, really popular um, in the literature in news um, is deep learning. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning and it uses uh, neural networks um, that are uh, modeled after you know, our human brains um, to uh, make predictions. Um, and you know, in this case, for example, um, you can take an echocardiogram and then through a deep learning um, neural network uh, model, you can predict the LV ejection fraction. Um, and deep learning really excels um, at image recognition um, and also audio data and uh, natural language um, process. So that was uh, kind of a brief, very brief introduction to machine learning. So the next question is, you know, why do we need machine learning in medicine? Well, in daily life, um, you have seen plenty of machine learning examples, I'm sure. For example, um, it started with a spam recognition uh, for your emails. You have Netflix, and we have um, transcription of audio data. You know, or we can use that for uh, epic dictation, for example. Um, and then more recently, we have uh, driverless um, driving, 
Um, so those are all machine learning uh, applications in daily life. What about in medicine? Probably the uh, first thing you think about when you hear machine learning is that it can um, predict things. Um, can, we can build better prediction models. But um, as I said earlier, um, unsupervised machine learning uh, is uh, very good at automatically identifying hidden patterns in data. So that's pretty important in medicine. Uh, machine learning is generally better suited um, than traditional statistics for nonlinear, complex, you know, highly interactive relationships. It's also um, a novel approach to um, make diagnosis, for example, using imaging and audio data. Machine learning is also very good at analyzing big multimodal data um, in the um, EMR actually. Um, and it can uh, deal with real-time uh, analysis and give you real-time results. So those are all the advantages of machine learning. But why does heart failure need machine learning? Um, I think that uh, there are actually several unique um, reasons um, that heart failure can especially benefit from machine learning. So first of all, we all know that heart failure is you know, serious, it's prevalent, um, it's a high cost, high touch disease. But uh, risk predictions um, is uniquely important for heart failure treatment, especially when you talk about you know, advanced heart failure therapies. Patient selection um, is also key in many different settings. Cardiogenic shock, when you are thinking about impellas and ECMO, for example, uh, LVADs and um, heart transplant. And you know, this is important because we, are, we don't apply the same treatment for everyone. Because if you apply the same treatment for everyone, then you, know, you don't necessarily have to really think about risk prediction. Um, Decision-making in heart failure, especially in um, you know, cardiogenic shock and advanced heart failure therapies, um, is often complex and dynamic. And this goes to um, what I was talking about earlier, that uh, you can't have very simple rule-based um, algorithms all those kind of decisions. Some diseases um, in heart failure, such as half path, uh, we think has very heterogeneous uh, mechanisms and uh, machine learning can really help us uncover those underlying mechanisms and potentially find uh, new treatments. Another thing that's very unique about um, heart failure is that um, we have a lot of devices already in patients. Uh, ICDs, cardio MAMs, LVADs, and a lot of them use CPAPs. And those machines all have power and they all have computer chips in them. Um, so they are, in a sense, ideal sensors and hosts for uh, machine learning algorithms. And another um, unique need um, is, um, you know, advanced heart failure expertise is generally concentrated um, at academic centers. And with machine learning algorithms, we can potentially train those and develop those at big academic centers and export those to smaller rural um, areas. And in that way, we can perhaps expand advanced heart failure expertise. So next, I'm gonna show you some um, applications, examples of machine learning in heart failure. And uh, I will be brief because I actually uh, you can find those in many review articles, and uh, I want to talk about um, later in more detail some of the newer um, advances in machine learning. So one example um, is uh, about prediction, and I started with this because you know that's probably what people think about um, the first um, when they hear about machine learning. So as we know, um, certain day readmissions in heart failure is actually notoriously hard to predict. So can machine learning um, predict better than traditional statistics? So this group of researchers used a deep learning um, neural network model, or DUN, and, and applied it to longitudinal EMR data within the uh, partner's healthcare system in Boston. Um, they used you know, tens of thousands of patients and uh, heart failure uh, admissions. And they pretty much included everything you can find in the uh, medical record system, demographics, utilization data, diagnosis labs, medication procedures, and even unstructured data from clinicians' notes. And in total, um, even after uh, variable um, selection, they used a total of 3,512 um, total variables. 
And here is how machine learning on the second row um, compares to logistic regression. And as you can see, the um, area under the curve is you know, slightly better uh, than logistic regression and positive predictive value and sensitivities are still too low to be really used in clinical practice. So machine learning for some predictions actually does not do a much better job than traditional statistics. But there are actually a lot um, of other things that uh, machine learning can do uh, in addition to just predicting. So for example, machine learning, like I said earlier, is very good with using um, new types of data, graphical images, audio data. So this group of researchers, for example, try to use ECGs alone to screen for LV dysfunction. And as you can probably imagine, that could be very useful in the primary care um, doctor's offices. Um, so they used a convolutional neural network uh, model to try to identify patients with an LV ejection fraction less than or equal to 35% using just ECGs alone. And this is time out of Mayo Clinic um, group. And they used, you know, again, almost 50,000 uh, ECG and TTE pairs. And among those um, uh, studies, uh, about 8% had um, low ejection fraction. And then they validated this algorithm uh, on an independent uh, set of data. And here's how they did. Um, the machine learning um, algorithm was um, had an AUC of 0.93, so it's actually very good. Uh, if you look at the sensitivity and specificity, they are all in the uh, mid 80s. So that's actually pretty good. But what's more interesting is that um, the false positives, meaning that the patients who had um, a positive uh, you know, red flag on the ECG for having low EF, but actually had normal ejection fraction, um, they had a fourfold risk of developing LB dysfunction in the future compared to true negatives. So it's possible that machine learning using ECGs alone can not only identify patients right now with low ejection fraction, but actually can predict um, pa uh, patients who will develop low ejection fraction in the future. Another example is using um, audio data. So um, this group of researchers applied a neural network machine learning model to heart sounds um, to try to differentiate between healthy and half-half patients. Because we know that half-half is actually often uh, a misdiagnosis, especially in um, you know, primary care um, setting. And um, they, you know, this is an example of a heart sound um, graph, and they used uh, the diastolic, systolic duration, and 11 other features um, from the heart sounds that uh, were identified by this machine learning model. And here's how the algorithm did uh, in a test um, uh, data set. And the machine learning model was able to accurately um, identify half-path patients uh, versus uh, healthy patients and the sensitivity and specificity are both very high. Now, one caveat is that, you know, none of those um, um, algorithms uh, have really been externally validated in a completely different setting. And also um, the machine learning models in, in those examples don't really tell you how they came up with those predictions. And I'll talk about how we solve that problem um, in, a little bit later. I uh, want to highlight um, a machine learning example um, that uh, uh, we were involved in. So this is a, a project trying to uh, phenotype different cardiogenic shock um, subgroups. As I talked about earlier, um, uh, um, uh, a different uh, type of machine learning is called unsupervised learning, and it's very good um, in terms of clustering um, patients and uh, underlying, uh, discovering underlying patterns. So for this project, we use the multi-center cardiogenic shock working group registry. And uh, UW is actually a founding member of this uh, registry. And it has now over 3,000 patients. Uh, the hypothesis that we tested uh, was that unsupervised machine learning algorithm can uh, identify cardiogenic shock phenotypes with uh, distinct hemodynamic and metabolic profiles and in-hospital mortality. We use a consensus k-means clustering 
machine learning algorithm on um, our registry. And um, at the time, uh, in the derivation cohort, we had only 400 something patients. And then we tested our algorithm in both an internal and also an external validation cohort. And here's what we discovered. So the, on the left-hand side, um, this is a, a graphical representation of the clustering um, of patients. Each dot is basically one patient in our sample. So machine learning basically puts the patient into three clusters. Um, and in the middle panel here, I'm showing you the um, differences between the three clusters. Uh, those are the three different colored lines in terms of their hemodynamic variables and metabolic variable. So for example, this blue group here um, has very low cardiac index, has very high right atrial pressure and heart rate. Um, whereas, you know, for example, the um, red here, you know, has much higher cardiac in indices and a much higher blood pressure. And you can uh, look in detail about the metabolic variables. Um, so, and then, you know, based on those, we um, kind of summarized the three different groups. One group, we call it non-congested. Those were patients who basically had, um, you know, relatively normal feeling pressures and normal and organ functions. They obviously did very well in both the derivation cohort and in the two external, uh, in the two validation cohorts. Um, the second group uh, is what we term cardiorenal. Those are patients who um, had higher feeling pressures and mostly uh, renal failure with it. And they had higher mortality in, in the hospital. And the third group um, had the worst outcomes. And um, those are patients who, what we termed cardiometabolic shock. And that's um, patients who basically have um, high feeling pressures, uh, renal dysfunction, and also evidence of multi-organ failure, such as liver dysfunction and very high lactic acid and no surprise they had very high um, in-hospital mortality. So here it shows you that machine learning, you know, is, uh, can do a really good job of identifying hidden clusters in um, a disease and, uh, you know, this is accurate on an external validation cohort. But then you may ask, you know, now that we have the different clusters, you know, what can you do about it? How does that actually help you with um, patient care? So for example, um, we'll show you another example of um, how clustering can help. So um, in this um, paper, um, the researchers um, you know, uh, identified two different clusters of half failure, in this case, half ref and half half, and they um, apply this to a biomarker um, database um, in Europe, and basically identify the underlying um, biological pathways that uh, were most um, prominent in the two different types of heart failure. And as you can see, interestingly, for half path, for example, the uh, most prominent um, biological pathways have to do with inflammation, um, you know, leukocyte migration, uh, cell adhesion, those are all kind of inflammatory um, pathways. So clustering can, you know, really help you with um, understanding um, the underlying biological pathways and potentially researching new uh, treatments. Another example of how clustering can help you with treatment is um, uh, actually uh, in terms of identifying ICD responders. So um, we know that uh, you know, if we can identify who will respond to both ICDs and CRTs that can actually be um, both very effective and also save a lot of cost and, and unnecessary procedures. So in this case, they, uh, the researchers used a machine learning algorithm that incorporated both echo and other clinical data, um, and pretty much used a very similar machine learning algorithm um, and clustered patients into actually four different groups. And in this case, uh, two of the groups, so phenotype one and three, um, in those two groups, patients had a very good response to CRTD versus ICD uh, with a, a hazard ratio of around you know, 0.3 something um, for survival and um, I think heart failure and uh, exacerbation. Whereas uh, phenotype two and four basically had no response to CRT compared to ICD. So here you can see that the machine learning algorithm um, clustering patients can really potentially lead to um, a real-world application 
um, helping us identify ICD uh, CRT responders. And um, an ongoing research that uh, we are doing um, is to uh, use machine learning to evaluate treatment strategies in cardiogenic shock. And we are doing this because there is a lack of high quality evidence in cardiogenic shock. And you know, currently treatment is generally based on experience and there is a lot of variation among physicians and uh, uh, hospitals. So we are uh, leveraging the same multi-center cardiogenic shock working group registry and um, we are using machine learning to identify predictors of success uh, versus failure for each cardiogenic shock treatment by the ionotropes or the different types of MCS treatments. Uh, and we can predict the best treatment approach for each cardiogenic shock patient with machine learning. So that's something that we are um, doing here. So what are some of the limitations of machine learning and uh, state-of-art solutions to those limitations? Because you know, right now you, you can see that there are a lot of uh, machine learning applications in research, but um, like what Dr. Dichak uh, really likes to say, you know, how has machine learning changed the practice of medicine? And um, to be you know, honest, right now it really hasn't changed uh, very much. So how can we, um, why is that and how can we solve that? So as I see, there are three big problems with machine learning in medicine. There's a problem with prediction, there's a data problem, and then probably the biggest problem is an implementation problem. So first, um, we have a problem with machine learning prediction. And what do I mean by that? So whether you are using machine learning for diagnosis, prognosis, or uh, predicting response to therapy, it's, it's all a kind of prediction. And as I showed you earlier with the 30-day readmission um, example, machine learning, is um, you know, very often uh, no better or only marginally better than traditional statistics in making predictions alone. And also more importantly in medicine, um, you know, unlike for example, Netflix, uh, in medicine, the more important role of prediction is perhaps not actually predicting, but to underlie, uh, under, uncover underlying pathophysiological mechanisms, underlying diseases. And uh, one main barrier of most machine learning algorithms um, to date is a lack of interpretability. Machine learning algorithms have often been viewed as black boxes, and you can't really know how um, it's making decisions. And you know, a lot of people feel like we cannot trust machine learning algorithms. But one solution that we have now, which I will show you in detail, is something called explainable machine learning. And what do I mean by that? So explainable machine learning um, are methods that help us um, come up with model level and also individual level explanations. And that goes to the why question. And um, explainable machine learning can help us discover underlying mechanisms and generate new hypotheses. And also, it can really help us in trust and ensure fairness. So one, um, perhaps the most state-of-art um, explainable machine learning method is called the SHARP method. And it's actually developed by um, all the very strong computer science uh, department here at UW uh, by researchers um, Scott Lomberg and uh, Professor Sui Lee. Uh, the SHARP method computes contribution of um, each feature and also called variables, um, to the prediction that the machine learning model makes. And it actually uses game theory and uh, has very um, um, strong um, theoretical foundation. And if you are more interested, you can look at the paper uh, in the reference here. And um, to show you how this actually works, I applied um, the sharp method to um, our beloved Seattle heart failure model developed by Dr. Levy and Dr. Lincoln and others. Um, so what we did is uh, we applied uh, a tree-based machine learning algorithm um, called XGBoost to the original Seattle heart failure model derivation cohort, which is a PRACE trial. And um, in the original Seattle heart failure model, the Harrow C statistic is um, around 0.69. And in our machine learning XGBoost model, um, testing um, on a held out uh, validation cohort, 
the statistic is 0.72. But again, like earlier, it's only marginally better than traditional statistical model. But uh, the traditional uh, model in uh, Seattle high failure uh, uh, is uh, a model is a, a cost regression model. And with cost regression, um, you have the variable coefficients um, that, um, you know, that you can report from the model. And that gives you inherent interpretability because those coefficients um, can be turned into hazard ratios. Whereas for the XG boost model, um, the machine learning um, algorithm actually uses hundreds, sometimes you know, thousands of decision trees. The humans obviously cannot really interpret that. So the um, question is, can we use the sharp expandable machine learning method to explain how uh, XGBoost predicts heart failure mortality risk um, in, the, in the Seattle heart failure example? So, um, you know, this is the, the previous um, level of model explanation um, for machine learning. It basically gives you the overall model importance, um, sorry, overall variable importance uh, in the model. As you can see, you know, for example, BMI, wet blood cell count, systolic blood pressure, um, diuretic dose, you know, those are all among the top uh, variables in terms of importance um, in the model. No surprise, but this is still very, very inadequate. You know, it doesn't even, for example, tell you how this variable really makes predictions, help, you know, makes predictions. Here is the sharp method um, explanation. And it's much better. And let me walk um, you through this a little bit. So again, um, on the y-axis, we have the different variables listed in order of uh, importance, the most important uh, on top. And um, here, the different colors, the blue and red, um, are actually the variable's value. So for example, um, so red is high value. So in this case, high BMI. Blue here means low BMI. You know, for example, here, red means high white blood cell count, and blue is low red blood cell count, white blood cell count. And then on the uh, left hand, uh, right hand, um, this is worst survival. And um, those values, you can think of it as the uh, log of the hazard ratios. And then on the left hand um, is better survival. So here, the sharp method can tell you that, for example, if you have high BMI, red here, you have better survival. And if you have low BMI, you have worse survival in heart failure. Um, look at another one, for example, blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, you'll have better survival. And if you have low blood pressure, you'll have worse survival. Um, and you know, this is a much better way um, to look at the, um, how this model, machine learning model, is working to give you the predictions. But we have actually much more than this. As I said earlier, machine learning is really good at detecting nonlinear relationships. Let's use the example of hemoglobin uh, in this machine learning model for heart failure survival. What this is showing you is the hazard ratio, basically a log of the hazard ratio on the y-axis and the hemoglobin values on the x-axis. And as you can see, there is really a U-shaped curve here. And you know, it looks like the lowest hazard is actually around the hemoglobin of 15.5. And both below and above that, you have high, higher risk. And this is something that is you know, really widely known in, in heart failure. But you can actually look at all the other variables in the model as well. Another really cool thing about machine learning is that it can detect um, interactions between different variables. Here I'm going to show you an example of variable interaction, again, in the same um, um, example, same data set. Um, and the interaction is between uric acid level and diuretic dose. Here, I'm showing you just the uric acid level and its impact on the uh, survival risk of heart failure patients. When your uric acid, as you can see, is below around, say, 12, um, your risk is about the same. But when your uric acid goes above 12, then your survival um, hazard really goes up. Interesting, right? Um, and also, this, this has been previously known. But what's really interesting is if you look at its interaction with diuretic dose, and this is a busy graph. So here on the y, uh, on the x-axis is still the same uric acid level. 
And on the y-axis is the same header um, ratio that I was showing you. Here, I'm grouping them, um, the data uh, points in uh, by the diuretic dose. And the blue dots are um, patients with low diuretic dose, and the red dots are patients with high diuretic dose. And what's interesting is that if you the, uh, in patients with uh, low uh, diuretic doses, um, you know the uric acid level um, uh, is uh, proportional to your risk of dying, whereas um, in patients with high diuretic dose, um, for the high uric acid um, levels, uh, the patients actually have slightly lower risk of dying from heart failure. Uh, you know, one hypothesis is that. Uh, for if you are on high dose diuretic, your uric acid level is high because of the diuretic, not actually as um, uh, uh, not reflecting um, your actually underlying uh, heart failure risk. So machine learning you can see is very good at uh, under covering those underlying um, relationships. Machine learning models um, using the sharp method can actually also explain individual predictions, not just model level predictions. For example, in this case, uh, take a random patient. Um, zero is the average um, risk in, in the model. And um, here, this patient has a higher than average risk. And then the model will actually tell you why this patient has a higher risk. For example, the biggest contributors to this patient's heart failure risk uh, low ejection fraction, low BMI, and low systolic blood pressure. Um, and you can take another example, um, for example, another random patient. This patient has a much lower um, hazard um, than um, the average in this model. And why is that? Um, the biggest contributors to this patient's low risk um, are a relatively high you know, systolic and diastolic blood pressure low uric acid level, you know, normal renal function, and not low ejection fraction. So the sharp method, we can actually apply it and actually explain individual predictions. So I think that will really um, help clinicians and, and I guess patients too, really gain trust in machine learning models. It can also um, tell you, uh, explain uh, machine learning models that are applied uh, on images. Uh, here, I don't have a good example um, in heart failure, but I'm just showing you um, an example in, um, I guess on the, I found on the internet, basically. Uh, but using the same sharp model, you can actually explain why the machine learning model you know, thinks that this animal um, you know, uh, is uh, a dovature because of the long uh, bill, actually, and why this is a meerkat is actually um, using the uh, eyes and the nose to make that prediction. So I, I hope I have convinced you that machine learning models can, um, you know, it's no longer a black box and with explainable machine learning methods, uh, you can actually have richer explanations than traditional statistical models. Um, the second problem is a data problem. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of uh, timing, I'm going to go through this pretty fast. So uh, in medicine, um, unlike, uh, for example, Netflix, um, data um, are costly to gather and label. You know, many diseases just don't have massive number of patients. For example, heart transplant, you know, L-band. Uh, and machine learning models typically um, do need much larger number of patients uh, than traditional statistics to work well. And uh, another problem is that data sets that we use are often not representative of the larger disease population. Um, also, it's difficult to incorporate multimodal data in EMR. You know, for example, clinician nodes, lab results, um, ECGs. So how do we solve those? There are actually a number of new solutions. Uh, for example, transfer learning, uh, machine learning assisted labeling, um, and generative adversarial networks. We can also apply some of the state art natural language processing methods to EMR data. To give you one example, um, this is an example of transfer learning. And what that means is that, you know, how does that compare to traditional machine learning? In traditional machine learning, you have one data set, you apply an algorithm, and you learn, you, you, you use that to um, learn the data set for one prediction task. And then for a different data set, you apply a different algorithm and you start all over again, you learn again uh, a different model. But in transfer learning, what we do is that 
we apply an algorithm on one data set and we learn something and we come up with a model. And then we can actually use the knowledge gained from that model and apply that model to a smaller but related data set. And then that will really help you learn this smaller data set. Give you a medical example. So for example, if you are trying to use distrust summaries to predict heart failure readmissions, what you can do is you can actually train a model on a very large sample of generic distrust summaries. And those don't even have to be labeled. And you know, so it's very easy to get there are actually databases of you know, millions of distrust summaries. Um, but those are unlabeled, so you cannot use that to predict heart failure readmissions. But then you can use that model that you just trained um, on you know, generic distress summaries and use that and train it again on a smaller number of patients, um, a smaller number of heart failure distress summaries um, that have related uh, readmission outcomes. This way, you know, to put it intuitively, it's like the model is first using generic distress summaries to learn the lingo, to learn the medical lingo and gain some background understanding of medicine. And then with that background understanding, then it's much easier to teach that computer model um, what to look for, uh, for heart failure readmissions. So now I'll give you um, a summary and some future directions. So, um, you know, for the future, how can we solve the third problem, which is the implementation problem? And here are the, the four domains that I came up with. I think those are probably the, the most important um, challenges uh, in terms of getting machine learning to implementation in clinical practice. The so one is clinical efficacy. We have to show that machine learning models not only improve prediction, the you know, area under the curve, for example, but actually improve real world outcomes in patients. Um, and that might need rigorous testing, including randomized control trials. Um, there are actually some going on with machine learning. Next is we need to solve the transparency and interpretability um, issue. And um, we need to make the machine learning code open source so that everyone can um, examine the, the code um, and also the explainable machine learning method that I showed you earlier. I think that will really uh, make a huge difference in terms of transparency. Machine learning models need to be reliable, meaning that and you can have that uh, developed in one hospital and be able to transfer that to a different hospital or clinic and have it work uh, just as well. And we need to have building quality monitoring algorithms that continuously monitor or even better improve the um, quality of the machine learning uh, model results. Lastly, very importantly, um, we need to be mindful of um, ethical and compliance concerns. Uh, we need to make sure that machine learning models are evaluated for biases. And also, once we have a model, even if the model is free of any bias, we need to make sure that we use the model without biases. So in summary, uh, machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed uh, by learning from data. And machine learning is traditionally divided into supervised versus unsupervised learning. And there are various machine learning algorithms, including deep learning, uh, and they excel at nonlinear, highly interactive relationships, uh, analyzing images and audio, pattern recognition, and also streaming data and making real-time predictions. There are many real and perceived barriers um, of machine learning that are actually quickly being uh, resolved by new and improved machine learning algorithms. So what I, do I think um, is the future of machine learning? There's still many challenges um, in heart failure that I think will be further uh, well addressed using machine learning solutions. It is quickly expanding into many areas of machine learning research, uh, but solving the implementation problem will be key in the future. And to do that, we need an interdisciplinary uh, workforce um, to drive machine learning research and implementation in medicine. And lastly, I think the future of machine learning is bright because patients would be the biggest beneficiary. Thank you for your attention. And uh, here are my mentors and collaborators. And uh, I want to um, thank um, for the thanks the Locke Foundation and also the Respect family uh, for their generous research support.